And so this afternoon, we're going to kick off uh, today's session talking about the Holy Spirit, give the power. And one thing about in order to walk in power, the first thing you must have is to walk in faith. Many Christians agree with the Bible, but they may not necessarily believe in the Word of God. Agreeing with the Word of God is a big gap between believing and actually agreeing. Most of us agree, but we may not necessarily believe. So this afternoon to kick off, I want to show us, I want to bring us to Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 to 21. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 to 21 says, For I truly I tell you, if you have faith in the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. If you have faith of a mustard seed. And, and you find that there is constantly the battle between unbelief and our faith. And it all exists right in our head. Many Christians struggle with faith because sometimes we think that after having faith, we are responsible to see the things that God performs. Or we are responsible, like whether you pray for healing, when someone go and lay hand on the seat, they felt that they are responsible to heal the person. Or you're praying for a certain situation, sometimes our mind we pray, but we never actually dare to believe that God can answer the prayer. So I want to ask the Lord, the Word of God, to speak to you today, to give you an idea about your spiritual position, so that you know exactly where you stand spiritually, so that you know actually are you actually in faith or you're still in intellectual, in the intellect. Many of us read the Bible intellectually, and as such, we only see the Bible through the lens of the mind, which is the beginning. But beyond that, there is the spirit that we must capture. So that with this spirit, the Bible says that if you have a faith as a mustard seed, that means you don't need to be a lot. You, all you need to do is believe what God says He can do, He will do. And if you just start to believe, even if you start to pray for people, if you never pray for people, for those who are not well physically, I invite you to start walking in that direction. You will never pray for people who are not well, or you will never pray for situations, believing that God can make the difference. Today is a good start to believe what God says He will do, He will do. The thing is this, whatever that we need in our life, there is a verse in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Whatever that we have in our life is already been given. The Bible says that in His divine power, he has given us all things pertains to life and godliness. So this is the verse that is the foundation. That means God has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. He's already given. He said He has given to us all things. All things means you need in this life, in the physical, in the spiritual. That pertains to your life. That means your your living everyday life and to godliness in your spirituality. And God has given us to us all. How do we know He has given us to all? How do we possess it? It's through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. One of the most underestimated virtue, or one of the most underestimated um, feature in our life is knowledge. Because most of us, will, those who don't have knowledge of what God has promised you, chances are you will not see it happening in your life. The good things that God has promised you starts with knowledge. That means if you have no knowledge of it, you will not walk in that reality. If you do not know that you have power to trample on snake and scorpion, you have no knowledge of it, or if you agree but you don't believe, then you will be always be afraid of demonic spirit. There are many Christians who are still afraid of demonic spirit. There are many Christians who are still afraid of trespassing evil spirit, and there are many believers who are still torment by unclean spirit in their life. How is that so? Because we have not come to the faith to believe. When the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, He said, I'll give you power to trample over snake and over snake and scorpion. Now, that, that, these, are, these are promises that God gave to us in Christ. I give you authority to trample. Serpents and scorpions represent unclean spirit and evil spirit. This is the power of every believer. In fact, not only serpent and scorpion, but over all the power of the enemy. Whatever Satan has, and all the various principality, rulers, principality, wicked forces in the heavenly realm, dark forces of this age, on earth, above, underneath, you know that every believer has authority. 
But yet, I still have Christians who are so afraid of demons. I still see believers who are afraid of unclean spirit. But yet, the Bible says this is what God has given. So therefore, this is knowledge, first thing. You must first have knowledge, second. You may agree, but you may not believe. If I don't have no knowledge of this authority, I will be always, as well as a Christian, I will still be afraid to antagonize the enemy. Most Christians don't like to antagonize. They, they have this concept, let's not antagonize, let's not stir the hornlessness. You know, let, let's, 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 let's live in peace, you know. But the Bible says that you have authority to trample upon snake and scorpion. I want you to speak the word spirit. I have authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions. Yeah, say that to yourself in your spirit. This is your authority. That means you are not subjected to the, to the influence, spiritual influence of this world on earth and above. You know, the book of Ephesians named now the four categories of rulers, principality, dark forces of this present age, and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realm. You know, all these realms that you have are actually beneath you. Why? Because you're seated with Christ in the heavenly realm next to the Father. Your position in Christ is the highest. That's your knowledge. This is our knowledge. This is the first category. That means I must have knowledge of it. Secondly, I must transit from, uh, from uh, knowing, agreeing to believing. Most of us don't go beyond agreeing. We agree with it, but we don't really believe. Now, when you don't believe, then whatever God promised to us, you don't see. There are certain things that happens in your family that's not necessarily coincidental. Sometimes sickness that trans that transmit from generation to generation, that there is a pattern. Sometimes there are depression that continue in the household from generation to generation. Sometimes in the family you find in the house there's no harmony, there's no peace, there's constant squabble, there's constant unrest in the household. These are not coincidental. These are just not just natural environment. This a situation where if you begin to pray and you begin to seek the Lord, you find God will begin to show you there are spiritual forces operating at your home that's causing disturbances. And, 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 and believers must have some spiritual awareness of that. And so that then, having that awareness, then what do you do? Having that awareness, then you can pray. Now that's the reason most people don't pray, because they don't believe in the power of prayer. They think prayer is just a process, an activity that just organized. And so therefore, they just need to participate in just being there, just pray. If you believe in the power of prayer, technically, we should not be living in fear and anxiety. If you are still living in hopelessness, anxiety, and fear, that means, that means very likely you have not believed in the power of prayer. You believe in the activity of prayer. But you don't believe in the power of prayer. So many people pray just going through the motion, but they do not necessarily believe that prayer can move a mountain. That's why you find, how do we know? You just take a look. Most churches, when it comes to prayer time, 5% sure, 10% sure. When will they really believe in prayer? When somebody in the house is dying, when they're going through an emergency, then they show up for prayer. It's very strange. You don't believe in prayer until somebody in the family is very sick or in the major emergency, how then suddenly you believe in prayer. Well, sometimes things happen in life, you know, the enemy went for bad, but God can turn it for good. But I want to encourage you, you, you are not tapping, we are not tapping on the resource that God has given us. Your, your prayer can move mountains. Your prayer is sufficient to shift things in the spiritual realm. You know, there's sometimes in the household, there's always a lot of unrest in the household. People think it's normal. A lot of people accept that as normal. They are, this is part of my family. It's the way it is. No, not necessary. If there are unrest in the household, we can speak peace over the family. Sometimes there are spiritual forces that's working to destabilize the peace in the family. And we can take authority declaring power and peace over the family. Sometimes it's over the family, sometimes unrest is over your own heart. Many people, why do people take medication to sleep? Why do people medicate themselves? Because there's unrest up here in the mind. 
And, and it is unfortunate that as Christians, that we have all the power God says He has given us in His divine power, He has given us all things pertains to life and godliness. That means He has already what you need peace, whatever you need joy, whatever you need divine help, whatever that you need, you know, power. God says, I've given you all things pertains to life and God. That means the daily living, the challenge you face in your life. I have given you everything pertains to that to overcome, to be more than an overcome. That's why God said, I will make you more than an overcomer. So if this is a promise of God that we are supposed to be more than an overcomer, but yet in our life it seems to be overwhelmed, then one thing you need to see is that that means likely you are not walking by faith. And if you are not walking by faith, chances are you will be walking in defeat, and you are probably walking in stress, and you are walking in worry, and you are walking in fear. And the funny thing is that fear, stress, anxiety, worry over a long term, protracted time will begin to release bad chemical within your body. For external now, it becomes internal. And the reason why some people begin to fall sick is not because they are weak, but because the system is weakened. You know a simple word, the Bible says that a merry heart do good like a medicine, but a broken spirit but I'm going to be dry the bone. This one, the book of Proverbs, I think it's 1722, I can't remember the show, 1722 or 24, I may be wrong. The Bible says, the merry heart do good like a medicine. That means when you are, when you are joyful, when, when you have joy instead of weariness and being overwhelmed. Okay, thank God I remember correctly. So when you have joy in your heart, the Bible says it's better than medication. But yet the Bible says even your spirit is broken, your bones is dry. Do you know in your bones is where some of the immune system is located? Your bone marrow is where the immune system are located. So, you see, the Bible is way ahead of science. Before science discover about the bones and why the dry bones is a bad sign, you know, God in his wisdom already let us know that when your heart is merry, it is like a good medicine. And it's true. If you, you know, I do not know, I, I can never, I can, I cannot emphasize this more than uh, uh, I could. I, I notice your average Christian don't really are not that joyful most of the time. You know, they are, they are always angry sometimes, hostile, you know, walking in uh, anger, sometimes in, in, in stress. And it's not your fault. It's because of your lack of that you do not know that this is your portion. And let me tell you something, a merry heart doesn't mean everything is going good. You tell me, which of us come from a family that is perfect, that everything is good? Every one of us come from a family that's got challenges. And some of us come from families that are more broken than others. Some of us come from families that have more challenges. Some of you have to work two times or go do two jobs when they're younger just to maintain the family. Some of you have to wrestle with you know, family problems, with parental issues, and then you have to deal with work issue or school issue, you know. And uh, some of you, you know, our, our, our Filipino friends, they have to leave the family behind and while they are here, you know, they have got family issues back home, challenges with husband, challenges with children. How do you handle all this? How do I maintain a very hard possible? That means if I continue to trust God, if I continue to believe in Him, that even right now, or even today before service, some of you may have a quarrel with your family before you came, or somebody scolded you, you know, you have a very nasty encounter before you came. How do you have a merry heart? Or you have a very tough week before you came. How do you have a merry heart? Let me tell you something. <coughs> a merry heart is a decision. It's not a circumstances. That means I don't depend on the circumstances to be married. That means in spite of my situation, I can choose to be married. That is the exercise of the will. Amen? Amen. That means you can choose anytime to be happy. Then the next question, Pastor, but if this is a situation, if my life is full, how do I be happy? Now let me tell you something. Even if you are sad, the situation can change. Even if you are depressed, can the situation change? In fact, the situation remains the same, but you get weaker. When God says, I give you power to overcome, that means He don't remove the problem from you, but He makes you stronger. 
the first step is to first enjoy the peace. Because when you don't enjoy the peace, you don't have the frame of mind to attack the problem. And we believe say amen. Thank you for your overwhelming response as always. If you don't have a peace of heart, if you are constantly worrying under stress, you are already lost. That means in that position, you have already moved out of the position of faith. That means you don't have to fight, you lost your way. When the children of Israel faced Goliath for 40 days and night, Goliath taunted them. None of the enemy, none of the soldiers that to come out and face Goliath. They lost the battle even before they fought the battle. The battle was lost before they even fought it because in their mind they see that it's impossible to overcome the battle. But yet when you have a man who is filled with faith, the minute David comes and says, you know, what is the reward for overcoming the life? Well, I like that. The fact that the first concern for David is not can he survive beating Goliath. The fact that he asked, what is the reward for Goliath? I mean, is, he is totally confident he'll put Goliath in the pocket. What kind of a secret, what kind of man, what, what caused a young boy at 16, 17 years old, barely even physically developed, had the full confidence to take on a giant between 9 to 12 feet, whose bicep probably is bigger than his thighs, and say that what is the reward for overcoming this giant? That is in his mind. He already was walking in peace, he was walking in faith, and you really see Goliath dying before him. He said, I will cut you into pieces and feed your body to the birds of the air. What? This is faith. That means before it happened, I already believed. But guess what? Many people also believe what will happen before it happened, but you usually believe in the negative. Now, there's also faith. Right? You believe that the bad one will happen. You believe that I should die one. That's also faith, by the way, in case you do not know. That, that's reverse faith. It's called fear. But it's faith also. That means you, you have faith of the negative happen. Let me recall, let me bring us back last week's message. Last week's message. In the book of uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 28. Thank you, Jesus. Numbers chapter 14, verse 28. God speak to the children of Israel, whatever you have declared for the giants in the land. Because in Numbers chapter 13, when they sent spies to explore the land, 12 spies came and went, 10 spies came and said, no way. We are like grasshopper, they will kill us, they will slaughter us. Those buggers are huge. There's no way we can overcome them. But yet God promised them you shall have houses you don't build, vineyard you don't plant, well we don't build, this will be yours, these are your inheritance. But they contradict the report of God. And so God said, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. Now this is, this is a very powerful thing. That means God is obligated to perform according to what you believe. Whether it is good or bad. That's why I say, choose this day, blessing or curse. Oh. Choose this day, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Choose this day, life or death, blessing or curse. That means, listen to this, guys. That means God is obligated. He is actually being bound to perform according to what he believes. Whether life or death. That means he will come. Deuteronomy 30, he said, I call heaven and earth as witness against you today. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. That means, either side you choose, I can, I will make it happen. Because this is, it's like, it's like seed, the principle of seeding. Whatever seed you sow on the ground, whether intentionally or unintentionally, it will grow. Your intention doesn't matter. Even you accidentally spill a seed, you know, on a place that you never intend to sow, but it will grow. That means, that means God is saying that I have a spiritual principle that will trigger an operation. The minute you start to believe, it triggers a principle to operate in your life. So you better choose carefully because in the principle of faith, you can either have faith in the negative stuff or you can have faith in the things that are positive. You can have faith in the things that bring death or you can have faith in the things that bring life. You can have faith in the things that brings blessing or the things that brings cursing. That means both are workable. That means faith don't just walk in the unidimension, it walks in bi-dimension, both. 
So it's very important what you believe because if you believe in the things that bring death, well, your faith will activate it. That's why the Bible is saying, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life lies in the power of the tongue. Right? So in other words, whatever you say, you bring to pass. That's why God said that as I live, I will do according to what you say. Okay, Sunday, you want to be so serious and depressed. Okay, let me help you to turn the, tune up the atmosphere a little bit. The good news is this then. That means, in other words, listen to this very important. In other words, it is very important to train our spirit and our mind to believe when everything is coming against you. That means when Lazarus has been dead for four days, when Jesus came and wanted to raise, to raise Lazarus, do you know what did Martha say? Martha said this, Lord, it's been four days, his body is stink. And Martha is not wrong because she's stating a fact. So she's not lying. She wasn't denying the truth. She was stating a fact that the body would have stink by now. But just in a little, she stated, just believe. That means when you operate in faith, you're operating in the principle beyond sight. That's why the Bible says, the just shall live by faith, right? The just shall live by faith, not by sight. But most Christian, 80%, the Christians shall live by emotion and feeling. I guarantee you, when you live by emotion and feeling, you will feel miserable. And then you'll find time again why, why God is so disappointing, never come true for you. So we try to move God with our tears, we try to move God with our anger, we try to move God with our begging. The Bible says, faith move mountain, not begging. Begging don't move mountain. Pleading don't move mountain. You know, you go to a lot of nation for a mission. I see a lot of people when they come for prayer, they are crying. Ah, I, pop the chair, pop the... I, I mean, I, I, I feel the sincerity, but sincerity <coughs> don't move mountain. Tears don't move mountain. Begging don't move mountain. Pleading don't move mountain. <coughs> Only faith move mountain. This is a principle in the spirit. Human being, if you are moved by sincerity, right? If somebody comes to your house, they want to borrow some right. Let's say, you know, this is a Japanese occupation period, no rest at home. If you don't give, I start to cry, I start to beg, I, you know, out of compassion. Okay, you know, supper is, you know, give them some food, right? You know, because they got no food, because they cry. A human being can be moved by tears, by pleading. If somebody comes come to you for help, and, and if you don't want to help because you're a bit reluctant, if they plead with you, if they continue to cry with you, if they continue to tell you, eventually you'll be moved. But I want to tell you, in the spiritual realm, God is not moved by emotion. God is not moved by how many years you've been a Christian, but God is moved by faith. And faith comes by hearing the word. That is the initial phase of faith of believing. And then there is a faith, what I call insistent faith. First King chapter 18. You know, after Elijah confronted the 800 false prophet of Baal, they have a showdown in the, in the mountain. And then he has declared, and by the way, this is after three and a half years that Elijah has given the word that there will be no rain. And the prophet speak, God will perform according to what the prophet declared. And so for three and a half years, it did not rain. And after that, Elijah told his son, Go, go, go up now towards the sea. And he said, go and check whether there are clouds or not. So he went out and said, there is nothing. He wanted to check, is there any clouds? Nothing. How many times did he go? According to the verse, to Jokalia, seven times. Then he said, go, come back, go there. Go and see, come back, go there. Go and see, go ahead. Seven times, the Bible said. And then at the seventh time, he said, there is a cloud. As small as the man's palm or man's head arising out of the sea. And if it is, you go up, say to him, prepare your chairs, go down before the rain stops you. Wow. There will be time you pray for people, or you pray for something, it didn't happen after one prayer, don't give up. There will be time you pray for three times, it didn't happen, don't give up. This, this is insistent faith. That means you believe that you will come to pass, you keep believing. Don't pray out of desperation, but pray out of faith. 
faith can work miracles. Today, I want to decree to you, whatever, whoever are facing a challenging situation in life, I decree to that speak life over your situation. Amen? Amen. In Jesus' name, that God will change your situation in life. There are, there, you must understand that there are spiritual forces that seek to destroy you. There are spiritual forces that seek to steal the joy from you. And therefore, you have to be spiritually very vigilant and spiritually be on guard so that you will not attack the wrong enemy. Most of us, we always fight the wrong enemy. How? Very typical example, husband and wife. Let me tell you, husband and wife, they always fight one another because they think they are each other's enemy. Right? You are the cause of my misery. You are the cause of my frustration. So you end up going to each other's throat. And guess what? The, the demon at the inside your house clapping for you. Come and clap for you. Yeah, you walk right into the trap. Take over Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 6, verse 11 and 13. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. So that you're able to stand against the wows of the devil. That means there are schemes, there are strategies, there are deceit from the enemy that come against you. He said, therefore, take up the whole armor. This verse 13, but just also 11. That you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Most Christians don't know why it's standing. People thought standing is stand there. Stand there. And do nothing and stand. No, standing is very powerful. What do you stand? You stand on the promise of God. That means when God says you're healed, but you experience pain and sickness in your body, what do you do? You continue to believe. This year has been an adventurous year for me. Because even though last year God healed me on my sciatica, you know, at different points, at different times. You know, you still experience some pain, pull, strain here and there. And I have to keep believing. Just, just, just this week. This week I have uh, some side line that I do. You know, I, I occasionally people invite me to do, to host events. And I still do once in a while. To supplement, you know, the pastor's income. And, and it was a three days event. You know, I've never woke up at six o'clock for a long time. So for three, three, three days in a row, I woke up at six. The third day, I woke up at four o'clock, and I sleep. So in Naros, you know, I stay at one o'clock, wake up at three, he woke up at four. So for three days, you know, there was insufficient sleep. And the third day, I woke up, oh, suddenly my this side pain, this side also pain. You know? And the first two seconds in my mind, I said, oh, this is bad. But immediately in my spirit recovered, I said, I speak strange. I says, I repeat life. I speak health to this thing. I repeat strength to this thing. He said, I resist the devil. Take a look at James 4, 7. Let me teach you today how you can resist the devil. The Bible says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. How do you resist the devil? That means when when you pray for something or when healing happens, I have been healed last year from my sciatica. But you know, occasionally the pain will still come. Some pain will still, you know, the other day I was so gung ho, I, I went sprinting, you know, those 100 meters sprint eight times. Oh my goodness. And the sixth time, my body was telling me, don't do it already. Stop, stop, stop. But you know, very gung ho, you still want to do it. After eight times of sprinting 100 meters, I can feel that my body is about to break down. <laughs> you know, so and what I was like, then I should have, I should listen to my body. But after six times, I knew I shouldn't continue. But, you know, being foolish, next thing, I don't know. <laughs> my car again. You know. So, you know, I don't know whether you know this in-court plantar facilities. Casey huh? you know, right? Casey is a personal trainer, so you know. This planter thing is the thing that keeps the soul sharp pain, like a needle pain. You know? So in short, what I'm saying is this. Anytime when I encounter a physical condition, today, I know how to stand back there. That means I don't let that pain bother me or start to say or die. But I begin to speak straight. I begin to be Christian. So the other day in the morning, I woke up because 
of the you know because it's a holy event so and uh, most of the time you know and so the day I woke up I don't know what's that it is painful and the first thing is oh dear please don't tell me now left pain now right also pain you know but I began to speak you know I resist the enemy that means there will be days where you get the decree you have to stand on the truth in the face of facts Listen to this. What is the fact? The fact is that both my hip is painful, but the truth is that Jesus has healed me. So we have a situation to, to deal with. We have to resist the enemy because the fact is that this is over. This is this is here. The, the fact is that the pain is here, but I have to speak the truth. He said, by his stretch we have been healed, right? So I have to speak the truth and lay over the facts. Now that's resisting the enemy, guys. Most Christians will cower, they will give up, they will begin to stop fighting, they do not know how to resist, we do not know how to stand on faith. Most of the time when you face this, because you start to, you know, you, 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 you begin to lose ground. To stand by faith means to protect you now, whatever that God has given you. Now this takes spiritual discipline and it takes spiritual courage and awareness. That means you are not and you you are not unaware of what is happening. That means, for example, if your family is having a challenge in your family, let's say your family, your parents are having a challenge in your family. In the midst of going through you know serious illness, whether illness in the family or you know, sometimes it's marital, marital issue, whatever, or home, children, some of you know, family back home. When you have a situation like that, begin to stand in faith and begin to speak life over your situation. Begin to speak life. It's very strange. I have never had more physical challenges than I had in the last one two years when I had physical injury. Three weeks ago, I tried to injure my gum. How can gum be injured? I don't want to speak to you offline. Start to bleed a lot. So for two weeks, I was bleeding very profusely. A couple of weeks here, I was bleeding some. So, you know, I'm an El Chico, I don't have a basic doctor. You know, I think Jesus is cheaper. So I began to speak here. <coughs> and today is well. Of course, you know, that doesn't mean I don't see the doctor. I mean, during my time, I went to see the doctor also. Last year I went to doctor in emergency that I never whole life never been to emergency department. Last year was the first time I went into emergency department. First time I find out that you go to emergency department and wait for seven hours. If I really did an emergency I would have died, you know, I can't have time to wait. Right? And 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 but you know, this is a system. The poor doctor, I feel so bad for the doctor. Because the doctor came in very positive, so Mr. Sir, I'm so sorry to wait to wait for you. I see you really. I mean the guy looks so tired, looks so worn up, probably worked 12 hours. Point you want to say is this, guys. When your faith is tested, you must rise up to the occasion. You must resist the enemy. That means when the enemy come and take what is yours. Today, if you walk down the road and somebody come and snatch your phone away from you, what do you do? Just let it take. Would you have it? Just let the man take away your phone. What would you do? You will fight back, isn't it? Because why it belongs to you. So to resist implicit in the meaning to resist the devil means you know what is yours. But if you do not know what is yours, you don't know what to resist. Amen? Amen. That means anything that you believe you have ownership over, you will never let people take it away from you. Does that make sense? But anything you believe you are not the owner, you, you, you will not insist that this is what is not mine. Right. If you if you if somebody go to your neighbor's house and take something, chances of you intervening is very less compared to a robber come to your house and take things away from your house. Why? Because of ownership. So implicit in this verse, resist the devil itself implies that you have ownership over peace, you have ownership over joy, you have ownership over divine help, you have ownership over abundance, you have ownership over peace. And this is yours. So when the enemy comes and steal, you must know how to resist the enemy. And so when you see symptoms, don't be afraid to resist them. When you see symptoms, speak truth over the symptoms. 
That means there are times when physical symptoms will appear. Or you have a relationship that you pray. You know, you got aware, and then suddenly you get fractured in the relationship. Continue to speak strength. If you have been oppressed by the enemy, you know, if, if, you, if somebody pray for you for to be healed, to be delivered, but after that, a few weeks, you find disturbances, continue to stand and say, I believe that I'm healed. I believe I'm set free. Continue to insist because the enemy can rob you. The only way, listen to this, guys, the only way the enemy can rob you is through you agreeing with him. That's why God said, I, according to what you decree, I will do for you. That means God is warning us. Be careful who you agree and what you agree with. Because whatever you agree with, I'm obligated to perform it. So choose very carefully. If you agree with death, I have to perform according to what you agree with. If you agree with life, I will perform to what you agree with. This is a spiritual principle. That means the sun shines whether for evil people or good people. Whether you're an evil man or a bad man, you sow a seed, you will grow. Right? The, the ground does not distinguish between an evil man or a good man. You, if you go to Philippines, you go to anywhere that still have agriculture, even your crook soul and seed you grow. The, the seed does not discriminate against your character. It's a seed. A ground don't discriminate how oh, you're a bad person or you grow. It doesn't. So it is God saying, be careful. Because your mouth lies power in life and death. So if you choose to speak death over your situation, with, which many Christians do unknowingly, and then when they have seen when they see death appearing in their life, they get confused. They blame God for it. They exchange. This is due to lack of awareness. Many Christians speak death over the situation. And then when the fruits of death come, let's take a look at the Proverbs 18 20. When the fruits they come, they have to eat it, they blame God for it. That means it's like you sow, you sow, you sow, you, you sow wild stuff, if you sow the wrong trees or wrong kind of fruits in your garden when they appear. You can't blame anybody else because you chose to see. So the Bible said, life, death and life lies in the power, 1821. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And what? Those who love it shall eat this fruit. That means there is a time where what you speak will bring fruits. That means there will be a time when it comes to pass. So that means it doesn't discriminate whether you sow death or you sow life. You, you activate the principle, it will come to pass. Amen? So in other words, I have to first. Know this. Today I see a lot of TikTok, a lot of YouTube, they like to use this word manifest. Whatever you say, you will manifest, right? I begin to see hey, this is very common. This seems to be inward today. Even the non-believer understand about manifesting. Chase about this, you should manifest. Huh? So, so how did they get this idea? Because they are right, because they understand somewhere, somehow they learn somewhere from some guru. Probably they you know stitch it from the Bible. And they understand that whatever, be careful what you believe, be careful what you say because you will manifest. Mm -hmm. Yes, whatever you keep thinking, whatever you keep believing, you will manifest. How many knows that? So your thoughts are super powerful. What you harbor in your heart eventually will bring to fruition. So it will manifest. So it's very important that believer, you have to sow the right things at the right time. So you must be cognizant of the things that you're sowing. You must be vigilant over the things that you're speaking. A lot of Christians, unfortunately, you know, we are constantly speaking death without knowing. Sometimes we are not necessarily speaking, but we are thinking death thoughts. That means when I say death, not physical death, but death is in negative where you find that you know the bad things will happen, you know. Have you ever noticed people who keep believing in bad things happen and they see more of it? Have you seen people say, ah, I'm very sway one? Well, guess what? You know, they really see the swayness in their life increase. Because the more sway you say you are, the more sway you will be. By the way, sway means bad luck for the spirit goodness. Yeah. If you think you sway, that means you really bad luck. Well, guess what? The more you confess, the more you see. Words has got a way of your, your tongue is a very powerful instrument. Guys, the Bible says he take a look at James chapter 3. I think it's we take a look from verse 1 to verse 4 in the book. James chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 4. The Bible says the man who can control his tongue is a perfect man. 
This is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But my brethren, uh, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. Listen to this. If anyone does not stumble in words, he's a perfect man. That means if your tongue is speaks correctly, God consider the person who speaks the right thing a perfect man. He said, also able to bridle the whole body. He said, you put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us. Right? That means the things that you that you control are the bits. The you control the, how do you control the horses? The bits. Right? He said, and then he said, when you when you look at the look at the ships, although they are large, they are driven by fierce winds. The fierce winds are the challenges in your life. But it is done by small rather. That means this okay. Very important. We are about to close. That means the fierce winds represent all the opposition in your life. If your rudder is weak, your direction of your life will be controlled by the fierce winds. That means whatever challenges in your life will bring you to that place. But if you have fierce winds, but you stay put with your rudder, that means you insist, you, 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 you stick on to your rudder. This rudder will control the direction of your ship. This rather is a tongue. That means the Bible says that in spite of the fierce wind, sheep can be driven by fierce winds, but they are turned by a small rudder. That means your tongue can steer you out of the fierce wind. I don't know whether you catch this today. If you catch this today, if you apply it to your life, Literally, you can navigate your life or the choppy water in your life by just being powerful, by, by the ability to use your tongues wisely. Thank you for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. That somebody is in the way. Amen. It is unfortunate majority of the Christians don't believe. They either don't believe or they don't know. Or they know but they don't pay attention. That's why the Bible says be vigilant. Very important so that you are aware. Are you setting traps for yourself? Because sometimes what you speak can negate what you pray. I've seen people who can pray for this thing and then suddenly the next thing they speak, they negate their prayer. It's very strange. You pray this prayer and then the next thing you say, that something actually negate whatever that you pray for. Because it's in contradiction. The Bible says, how can two work together unless you agree? That means your word you speak. And what you pray must be in tandem. It, it is a simple thing. Some of you already know this truth, but you're not practicing it as well. Because the challenge in practicing it, when everything is against you, when things are all you know looking, you know everything is coming against you. When the situation is not promising, the Bible says all you need to do is you must see, that means you insist, you believe that this is what you done. Amen. This is how you resist the devil. The Bible says, if you have faith, that's what you must see. Guys, this is actually life skill for your life. I mean, you learn accounting skills, you, you learn IT skills, all this is helpful. But this kind of skill is life and death. Because your accounting skill, when you face challenges, won't help you. Your IT skill in the face of oppression, it won't help you. I never see people get out of depression by having IT skills. Get any info. I think skill get out of depression. Never. I never see people who have accounting skill get out of fear. Never. I never see people struggle with suicidal thoughts. You know, go uh, HR skill get out of suicidal thoughts. That means there are different skills for different things. All these skills are important for your livelihood, but there are some skills that's important for your life. Amen. And being able to resist the devil can save you a lot of unnecessary torment and unnecessary nightmares and unnecessary pain that you need to go through. Some of you are going through pain that's not necessary. Some of you are going through situations that could have been avoided. That means if you have been aware, if you have been vigilant, if you have been standing by faith, if you have learned how to use your, your faith through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came upon us is so to empower us. The day of Pentecost is not for us just to feel good. You know, just Speaking in tongues and just you know being filled and goosebumps, you know, is so that you can walk in power. Amen. Amen. Jesus walked with power and authority, he was filled with power and authority. Um X 10 38, 28, 30, 40. 
test you. But then again, yeah, the reason why God filled Jesus with power is so that everywhere he go, he set many people who are oppressed by the devil. Amen. Why? How God anointed Jesus and Israel with the Holy Spirit for what purpose? So that he can fill with ghost bath? No. He filled the Holy Spirit with power. He went about doing good and what? Healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. For God is with you. Many people are oppressed by the devil without knowing. They thought it's just their life. They thought that, well, you know, this is. Many people accept the situation without knowing that actually there is an entity that's oppressing them. It's very sad, Christian, including. They have no idea that whatever you are facing in your life, the trouble you are facing in your life, is a result of spiritual entity influencing over you. The more you read the Bible, the more God will open your spiritual eyes. And the more you know how to position yourself, anointed by the Holy Spirit, so that you can position yourself and use your, you know, the weapon of your warfare. Remember, the Bible says, for the weapon of your warfare are not carnal, but it is spiritual, mighty in the pulling down of strongholds. Yes, but, but I pray that you will learn how to use it because when you know how to use it, when you know how to equip yourself with the weapon, whether it is faith, whether it's the word of God, whether it's through the Holy Spirit, whether it's through being, you know, engaged in the Spirit, whatever that you use, you must learn how to use your spiritual heart. And the Bible says that for these are spiritual things, it cannot be engaged in the natural. That is the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, I think it was 14 or 15 years there. It said, For things in the spirit is not discerned naturally. Yeah, those things that's in the spirit has to be discerned spiritually. Yeah. Thank you. For the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. The foolishness to him. It doesn't make sense. Nor can he can nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So imagine if you have got a situation where the Genesis is a spiritual issue. And they're trying to settle it with human issue, with human engagement. I don't know whether have you engaged in conversation in dialogue where maybe you are engaging a dialogue with a non-believer, or you're engaging a dialogue with somebody who has got a different bearing in their life in terms of sexuality. If you find that no matter how you talk to them, you can never come to them. Oh, they're living. You, you can never come to you. You know why? Because you're not dealing with the intellectual. You're dealing with the spiritual issue. Many will not realize that. Gender issue is not an intellectual issue. It's not a matter of preference. It's not a matter of lust or proclivity. No. It's actually a spiritual root. And therefore, you can never up talk, up discuss. And of the it, it, it is uh, it is our spiritual blindness. Let me close in, let me, let me, let me close this session with this. The last time in the Bible when such an LGBT issue came out was in a book called Genesis, in this place called Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, this is a very word we get the word Sodom in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so in the book of Genesis, when the issue in Sodom was so bad that it caused God to send judgment to them. So God appeared to Abraham and said, I'm going out to Sodom. I will destroy this whole city because of the wickedness of the, of the, of the place, of the city. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks back, when Jesus and the two angels came to Abraham, they told Abraham that was going to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, long story short, Abraham said, Well, you know, if these are 10 righteous people that we use to destroy their fire, you know. So, long story short, when the two angels reached Sodom and Gomorrah, the inhabitants there, they, they want to physically violate the angels. It's how bad it is. Including the teenagers, the young boys, they want to physically violate the the angels. Now this 
You think this physical? No, this is not physical, it's spiritual. It's not about preference for sexuality, it's not your sexual preference, no. It's a demonic issue. If you don't agree, that's okay. You know, we have no problem for that. That is okay. No? But as you grow spiritually to find the root of it, you eventually dis you discover that it is. Why? Because it bothered God so much. God never sent people down to counsel them and say, hey, you know what, there's a way to go. No, he said, I will destroy this sins of you. This two sins of you. Get out of it. So, Lord, get out of it. Why? Because judgment was coming. So, when you are in such a situation, you're like, you know, sorry, I don't want you to do it. That is spiritual roots to many things. And our job is not to get paranoid, our job is not to get, you know, um, Thinking that everything is spiritual, therefore we don't bear responsibility. No, there's, there's a part for men to bear responsibility, and there's a part that we recognize, you know, there's a part for human, and there's a part that is spiritual. And therefore, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the first thing is to enable you to see the spiritual reality. Amen. And so when you stand by faith, there are faith that can move mountains, and then there are faith where you can continue to insist on that faith. That means the first time I pray, I may not see healing. Second time I pray, I may not see healing. Third time I pray, I may not see restoration. Fourth time I pray, I may not see. Seven times, Elijah's servant went out to see whether there's cloud. Seven times there was nothing. Only at the seventh time, there was a feast, a cloud of the feast appeared. That means you need to be patient when it comes to your faith. Amen. There are some faith like God in the book of Genesis chapter 13. God brought Abraham to the land. He said, Abraham, lift up your eyes. I think it's in 13, 14, 15. He said, God told Abraham, he said, after lots of prayer, he said, lift up your eyes now and from the place where you are, north, south, east, west, for all the land which you see, I will give to you. That means that which you can see in your eyes, I give to you. In short, what is not written is that which you can't see, you won't be yours. Lift up your eyes as far as your eyes can see. That means your spiritual eyes, how you see, it depends on how your spirit is going to develop. Some people, even though it is dark, it is meant for them, but they can't see. So they don't possess anything due to our spiritual blindness. That's why Paul prayed that may you open the eyes of their understanding so that they can see. What you can't see, you can't possess. What you don't know, you can't possess. What you don't understand, you can't possess. In the spiritual realm, it's a very different operation. What you can't see, what you don't know, what you don't understand, you can't possess. Even though all these are in the Bible. If you catch this principle, guys, it's the beginning of wisdom. This is the beginning of wisdom. That means if you understand this principle, that everything starts by me seeing, starts by me knowing, starts by you understanding. That the mystery for those who understand more shall be given. Amen. People will perish for the lack of knowledge. So you find in the realm of the spirit, it is actually it's a very different key. Knowledge is a key. Understanding is a key. Seeing is also a key. So the Bible says, God told Abraham, as far as your eyes can see, this land belongs to you. That means the manifestation of this promise depends on first by seeing. That means God wants to give Abraham the land, but if Abraham can't see, he can't get it. There are many promises in the Bible, but if you see, but you don't see, that means I read it, but I don't believe it. Actually, seeing the real seeing is when you start to read. The first level of seeing is just agree. When you agree, there's no seeing. There's only there's only coming. That means you're being informed, but you're not necessarily uh, you're not necessarily believing. But the second level of seeing, when you start believing. For yes, as I mentioned before, I I I, I agree with healing, but I didn't realize I never agree. I never believe in healing. I agree with healing. I believe this. I mean, I agree that they are, they are healing the Bible. I agree that there are some people who lay their hands on people and they heal. But I never believe that when I lay hands on them, they are the, the people can be healed. Never believe that. But one day God exposed my deficiency. That means you agree, but you don't believe. Other people are seeing it, but I, I agree with them that they, they heal. I don't think that happened to me. I don't think when I lay hands on people, people get healed. And guess what? It never happened. Until I start believing. Until I start seeing in the Spirit. This thing is the beginning. The power of the Holy Spirit come upon you to cause you to see, cause you to be able to move in power, in authority, cause you to see reality 
so that you can also you can turn the situation in your life around. Whatever situation that you're facing in your life today, I want you to begin to see with a different outcome. I don't know what challenges you're facing in your life today. Whatever, you know, whatever challenges we face, some of us already see the outcome in it. Right? Whether it's bad or it's good. Some of us already see the outcome. So today, if your outcome is wrong, good news is that we can readjust. If your outcome is in facing on death, now we can shift to life. If your outcome is facing the curse, now we can shift to blessing. So today I want to invite you as we close to focus. If you are facing a situation that you have been believing for a bad outcome, or you've been believing for a situation that focuses on death and curse, go to readjust now. If you adjust your spiritual vision, your spiritual outlook, you can shift just like the rudder because what you see, you begin to confess. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. When the mouth speaks, it's like when I will end. You see, I do, your husband and wife. Yeah. Very powerful. Have you ever thought you go out and all you do is just I do. I do, I do, that's it. Four words, you are already married. Huh? Like that. Huh? And it's so powerful that even nobody can undo it. Right? To go through it, you have to go. It can you imagine going to register for our how much you pay for our end? Twenty-four dollars. Yeah. You know, to undo the agreement, our end go lawyer, thousands of dollars. Right? Our end is so cheap, right? But yet, in the land or the, the law of the land, it recognizes that two percent come together and both say, I do. I do. Yes, see. So be careful what you speak because it's binding. Yeah, it's binding. So you are either agreeing with death or you're agreeing with life. You are either agreeing with blessing or you're agreeing with cursing. Amen? So choose life, choose wisely. The power of the Holy Spirit come upon you so that not only you walk in power, walking in power means walking in the power of wisdom also. The capacity to see, to comprehend, to understand, and to perceive, and to be able to walk in the reality of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand.